Thank you so much for coming here. Thank you all you boys for coming to our temple. And um, since this is Washington, D.C., and since tomorrow is the um, National Independence Day, July 4th, I thought it would be good to talk about um, the idea of this phrase that's in the national anthem, the land of the free and the home of the brave. Have you heard of it before? The land of the free and the home of the brave. So this is a phrase that would, was taken from um, a song written by Francis Scott Key, who he wrote it during the War of 1812 when he was on a ship in Baltimore Harbor and um, there were bombs you know, going off and stuff. So he, he wrote this national anthem, which what became later the national anthem. Um, and in this national anthem is this phrase, the land of the free and the home of the brave. And it's interesting because he himself was an enslaver. He had six slaves, and, but in his lifetime, he, he actually freed those slaves. So that's a little interesting fact about him. But when I think about this phrase, I think that sometimes I don't really feel very free, and I don't really feel very brave. Um, what about you? Do you, do you re can you relate to that, that sometimes I just don't feel that free, and I don't feel that brave, yeah. So, um, yeah, so I was thinking, how would, how would you define freedom? What, what's freedom for you? Um, anybody want to shout out something? Like, when you think of the idea of freedom, what would, what would that freedom mean to you? Just maybe in a few words, yes? Uh, the, ability the ability to do whatever you want, and I didn't catch the last part. I said, that was what I said. Yeah. yeah. The ability to do whatever you want, maybe whenever you feel like it, right? Okay, what to else? To not have someone controlling you. Like to not have someone controlling you, okay? What else? Yes? Equal opportunities for race, gender, and color. Equal opportunities for race, gender, and color. Very good. What else? Anything else? Yes, I see another. The ability to choose whatever you want. The ability to choose whatever you want. And we'll take one more. Uh, the ability to control the mind. Senses. Wow. The ability to control the mind and senses. Thank you so much. Okay, good. And what about bravery? What, what, it, what it would, would it really look like to, to really be brave? How would someone define bravery? Yes, Kirtan. Not showing any fear. What? Not showing any fear. Not showing any fear? To stand up for what's right. To stand up for what's right. Great. What else? Anybody else want to throw out? Yes? Voicing your opinion every time you need to. Voicing your opinion every time you need to. Okay. Yes, right there. Making a decision and going through with it, getting to that. Great. Making a decision and following through with it. Great. Thank you so much. Yes, one more. Doing something even when it's hard. Doing something even when it's hard. Great. Great definitions. So let me just um, roll out for you what Webster's Dictionary says about first freedom and then bravery. So Webster says that freedom is enjoyment of personal rights or liberties, um, one not in slavery or confinement, enjoying political independence, being exempt from external authority or interference or restriction, independent, okay? That's what Webster says about freedom. Here's what Webster says, just briefly, about bravery. Exhibiting courage or endurance, being valiant or fearless. Okay? So that's a uh, little, some working definitions from us and from Mr. Webster. So I was thinking that sometimes I, I go on a Joppa walk um, chanting my rounds on my beads. We have a lake behind our apartment, and there's a lot of people who live in the neighborhood who have dogs. So a lot of times you'll see the dog with the master, and sometimes the, the master will let the dog off the leash, right? And the dog is so happy, he's just running. You know, we have this one dog in our neighborhood, you're gonna laugh, but we have this one dog in our neighborhood named, it's a black and white dog, and his name is Oreo, like the cookie. So, so sometimes the master, you know, lets Oreo off the, um, off the leash, and Oreo just goes running. And then, you know, when you know when that time comes and the master calls out, Oreo! And then Oreo has to run back 
and that master just clips his, you know, his leash on the collar, and uh, you know, and that's the end of his his uh, enjoyment, right, of freedom, his feeling of freedom, right. So for a few few minutes, for a few moments, he's he feels like he's free, he's running free, like. What's the book about the lion? Born free. Anybody ever read that? Born free. Yeah. So he feels like he's free. But then after a few minutes, he's back. He's on the leash. He's under control of his master. So it kind of reminds me of myself um, or maybe our situation that I think I'm free. But then, um, again, I'm under the control, as you said, right, so wisely. I'm under the control of my mind or my senses, or I'm under the control of the laws of material nature, right? Um, Srila Prabhupada says something really, really beautiful in one of his purports in the first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. Um, listen to this, it's, it's so beautiful and deep. So this is, for any of you scholars who like to note down verse numbers, it's um, Srimad Bhagavatam purport to canto 1, chapter 2, text 8. So in this, in this purport, Srila Prabhupada describes what is the need of the spirit soul? What is our intrinsic need? And he says, the need of the spirit soul is that he wants to get out of the limited sphere of material bondage and fulfill his desire for complete freedom. He wants to get out of the covered walls of the greater universe. He wants to see the free light and the spirit. And then he says, like, this is his, like, knockout last sentence. He says, that complete freedom is achieved when he meets the complete spirit, the personality of Godhead. Isn't that amazing? So I'm going to read that last line again. That complete freedom is achieved when he meets the complete spirit, the personality of, of Godhead. Um, that's the complete, according to Srila Prabhupada's deep wisdom, that's the complete freedom that, that we're seeking that can be achieved, um, you know, by this path of bhakti. So, as always, Srila Prabhupada just goes to the essence. He goes so much deeper than, than Webster's definition of freedom, right? And, um, you know, I, I have to ask myself, or maybe ask all of us, do we even realize our bondage in the, what he says, calls the covered walls of the universe. You ever think about that? That I'm just in bondage inside the covered walls of the universe. We don't even see those walls, right? But here he's, he's saying we're in bondage inside these walls. And, um, and then the next question to me would be, are we actually slaves, just confined in this material universe? So this reminds me of something, um, Kirtan, maybe you can help me with this. So my grandkids have been going to a Quaker school, Sandy Spring Friends School, that's on the property, which that it, was once on the, it was once the part of the Underground Railroad. Anybody ever heard of the Underground Railroad? Okay, somebody shout out a, a definition. Um, what, what is, or what was the Underground Railroad? Yes? It's the path slaves took coming up from the south, up to the north, where slavery was illegal, right? Coming up to the north. So this property, where Kirtan was going to school, is part of this underground railroad. And um, there was one woman named Harriet Tubman. Have you heard of Harriet Tubman? Yeah, yeah she's like one of my super idols. You know? So Harriet Tubman, um, there's Gita back there. She's, so Gita is sitting in the corner, who doesn't want me to talk about her. She's doing a project in upstate New York, um, like, uh, um, like, as part of, part of the National Park Service has given her a grant to develop this place where Harriet Tubman was after bringing these slaves up to the north. Is that a fair definition? Okay. So she was previously an enslaved woman herself. She escaped slavery. She was from Maryland's eastern shore. She escaped, and then she brought hundreds of other enslaved people, some of them children, some of them elderly people, up to the north where slavery was illegal. And they called her Moses, which is super far out because if you're you know, familiar with the Bible, Moses was the one who brought his, he brought his people out of slavery. So they called her Moses. And um, so, yeah, so this underground railroad 
it wasn't underground and it wasn't really a railroad, right? It was a pathway from the south to the north. So she was called a conductor on this underground railroad. And um, there's a quote that I love that's attributed to her um, that she said that, she said, I brought a thousand people out of slavery and I could have brought a thousand more, but they didn't know they were slaves. Isn't that deep? She could have brought a thousand more, but they didn't want to go. They didn't realize they were slaves, right? So my question to myself, and maybe to all of you, do we realize, do I realize my own enslaved condition? Um, how are we slaves of this material nature, or slaves, as you said, um, slaves of our mind and our senses? Um, so I, um, yeah, I turn to Webster again. What, what's Webster's definition of slavery? So he says, involuntary subjugation to another, complete ownership and control by a master. And, yeah, so then Srila Prabhupada, there's a verse that Srila Prabhupada used to often quote that, um, from the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. And it's, it's a very, um, has a very sort of lyrical cadence to it. I'll just say the first line in the Sanskrit. Um, a devotee is praying, and he says, Kamadinam katinam katida palita durnideshas. And what the verse says is, I've been a slave, or what the poet says, what the devotee is praying here in this verse, I've been a slave to the unlimited, unwanted orders um, of my own lust and desires. I've served them for so long, yet they are not satisfied, and I am not satisfied. And he says, oh my Lord, I'm so ashamed, but now my intelligence is waking up, and I'm trying to give them up, trying to give up those unwanted masters who are controlling them, trying to give them up, and trying to refuse to obey the unwanted orders of these desires. Now I want to surrender myself at your fearless lotus feet. Please engage me in your service and save me. What do you think? Do you like that? Sure. It's powerful, right? Yeah. So my thought about this is that real freedom or the real hero's quest, any of you <coughs> read Joseph Campbell, the hero's journey, you know, the archetypes of the different... So um, my thesis here is that um, the real hero's quest is to try to become free or liberated from the confines of what? Repeated birth and death. Try to become free from all materials of our body and mind. Like, don't you sometimes feel like you're just always being whipped by I'm hungry and thirsty, I'm hot and cold and this and that. I'm, you know, I'm F, no, no problem, but my mind's irritated. You know what I mean? It's just like, shh. Like wow, he's being whipped by these unwanted desires. <laughs> None of yeah. So, um, yeah, what do you guys all think? You know, isn't this um, the hero's quest? That's to me anyway. It's it's beyond all dragon slaying or explorations of the outer world or to explore. What do you think of it? To explore the uncharted territory within our own hearts to search out and find our long lost dear most friend, right? Just contemplate that for a little while, right? Um, and then I was thinking, you know, think about the, <coughs> the bravery of, like here there's a whole um, gaggle of boys here, right? So think about those Navy SEALs, right? They helicopter into uh, Pakistan, right? Nobody sees them and they secretly helicopter into Pakistan fearlessly and then they, unseen, they take out Osama bin Laden, right? Like super fearless. But then, maybe even more challenging, more fearless and more brave would be to take on the unseen domination of my own ego my own mind, my own wild, crazy senses. 
you know? That might be the greatest hero's journey. What do you think? It's possible, right? So, another point is that actually everyone is struggling in the material nature. Um, everyone is, generally speaking, trying to struggle to conquer the material nature. But in fact, everyone will be defeated. Um, like that, sometimes you hear people say, nobody gets out of here alive, right? We will be defeated by the material nature, no matter how brave or great or fear or strong he man, you know? Like, I just thought of Muhammad Ali. He was the, like the greatest fighter, right? And he used to say, I am the greatest. You know, he was so strong. He was beating everybody. But then at a certain point, he got, um, was it? Um, Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's disease. He got Parkinson's. And then he was actually a very spiritual man. And he spoke about how he had been so proud. And he had been bragging that he was the greatest. And now here he's defeated by this little disease, this little germ. You know? So, yeah, everyone's struggling, but everyone will be defeated. But I want to make the point, when we struggle to please Krishna, then he will bless us and bring us closer to his lotus feet. So I want to tell you a story about Srila Prabhupada. Sometimes Srila Prabhupada would get asked, what pleases you? And he would answer in different ways. Um, so, yeah, once a group of book distributors really wanted to ask Srila Prabhupada what pleases you, and they really wanted to hear Prabhupada say, when you distribute my books. But he didn't say that. He said, when you love Krishna, that's what pleases me. But then another time in Australia, he said something really interesting. Um, he said, someone said, well, how can we please you, Srila Prabhupada? And he said, he kind of paused and then he said, I am pleased when I see you struggling to serve Krishna. And this devotee who asked the question, like he got completely shocked. He was thinking, what is this? Prabhupada, some kind of a sadist or something? He's pleased to see us struggling? Isn't that really mean? You know? But no, Srila Prabhupada um, wanted to see us trying our best, right? We, many of us just went to this Japa experience at New Vrindavan. And while we were chanting Japa, Sachinanda and Swami kept encouraging us by saying, just try your best, just try your best, just try your best. So yeah, Srila Prabhupada wanted to see us struggling to just try our best. And knowing Krishna, um, we'll see our sincerity and that he would help us, right? Because he's sitting in our hearts as the super soul, right? But then we could say that he's sitting in our hearts as the super friend, right? Ever think about that? He's the super friend sitting in our hearts. He's when, like, when you travel through the body of a pig, he was there with you. you travel through the body of like a, a bug, he was there with you, right? So he's the super friend. Um, yeah, so um, there's a beautiful poem by Bhakti Vinod Thakur, who's our great grandfather guru. So if you look at the middle altar, you can see Srila Prabhupada, then his guru Bhakti Siddhanta, then his guru, Gorpasharas Babaji, and then Bhakti Vinod Thakur, who is the father of Bhakti Siddhanta and sort of the great great grandfather spiritual master. So he wrote many beautiful poems and books in Bengali and Sanskrit and English. He wrote one long beautiful poem called The Jiva Soul. And two of the stanzas that are kind of toward the end of this poem, he talks about this brave spiritual heroism. Okay? We're talking about bravery. Talking about heroism, right? Talking about freedom, and then the flip side, right? Slavery. So here's what he says in these kind of and toward the end. He says, so he's talking, it's called the Jiva soul, and he's talking about to the soul. He says, so push thy onward. He's almost like a military commander speaking. He says, so push thy onward march, O soul, against an evil deed that stands with soldiers' hate and lust, a hero be indeed. And then he says, Maintain thy post in the spirit world as firmly as you can. Let never matter push thee down, O stand heroic man. Nice, huh? You like it? Good. Okay, so then 
maybe you're listening to all this and maybe you've been kind of following along with this idea of the hero's journey and all this, but maybe you're listening to this, maybe you're thinking, um, actually this is really too hard and, and I just can't do that, you know? I can't do it on my own, right? But here we have Lord Ram. Everybody see Lord Ram? You see how his right hand is up, blessing everybody? Like that? He stands there like that all day. <coughs> yeah. And so Lord Ram says, anyone who comes before him and takes shelter of him and says, my Lord, for so long I've forgotten you, but from today I am remembering you. From this day I am yours. He says that anyone who comes before him and says that, he will award that person. Anybody know what he awards? He will award them courage. Okay? Courage, strength to struggle. And he says, uh, yeah, so courage or bravery to try our best. You know, we can come before Lord Ram and beg him, and he will give you that courage to try your best. Um, yeah, especially from his right hand that he has a blessing all of us. So, um, actually, it's impossible for us to conquer or surmount the insurmountable confines of the material nature on our own. But if we take shelter of Krishna or Lord Ram or Lord Chaitanya and Lord Nityananda, they will partner with us. Um, just like Krishna drove the chariot for Arjuna, right? Um, if we pray to them for their help, pray to them, their help is like, it's called a power greater than ourselves, right? Pray to them to help us, to partner with us, and give us a power greater than our own power, um, and help us try our best. Then with their help, we can actually overcome our bad habits, maybe our things we're addicted to, um, with their help, right? So, talking about bravery, now I'm calling it courage. What is courage? What is bravery? So, there's one Christian author I like. I don't know if you've ever read. There's a really cute little book called Help, Thanks, Wow. I suggest you get it. It's a small book, but it's really a, a good, fun read. Help, Thanks, Wow. Kind of says it all, right? Help, Thanks. Wow, you know? So the author of that book, Anne Lamott, said something really wise about courage. Listen to this. Um, she said, courage, or you could say bravery, is fear that has said its prayers. You like that? Courage is fear that has said its prayers. So yeah. Um, in Bhagavad Gita, in the second chapter, Krishna talks about the regulative principles of freedom. What? That sounds like totally counterintuitive, right? Aren't freedom and controlling the senses two opposite things? Um, yeah, don't they sound like two opposite things? But the fact is, we actually have to control our mind and senses, or they will control us, right? We can become slaves of our Slaves, right? Of our unbridled, uncontrolled mind and senses. Um, and real freedom, you know, real freedom is to um, know that nothing actually is mine, but only Krishna is mine. And, um, yeah. So one thing that's really a beautiful, beautiful thing about Krishna's qualities is that he actually gives up his freedom. So he's the supreme independent personality of Godhead, right? But he gives up his freedom and his independence, and he becomes a slave of the love of his devotees. If you don't believe me, this was stated by Hanuman, right here. Hanuman said that. That the Lord becomes a slave of the love of his devotees when the devotee thinks that Everything, all this stuff, it's not mine, nothing's mine, but Krishna is mine, or Ram is mine, and I am his. Then Krishna becomes the slave, or Ram becomes the slave of a devotee like that. And there's a story that, that Lord Ram, before he even killed Ravana, 
So Ravana had a brother named Vibhishana. You heard of Vibhishana? So Vibhishana, even though it was the evil Ravana's brother, he was a devotee. He was a pure devotee of Lord Ram. And so before Lord Ram even killed Ravana, he, he made Vibhishana the king of Lanka. You know, wow. And, and then somebody said, well, but what if, what if Ravana surrenders to you? Then what are you going to do? And then Lord Ram said, then I will make Ravana, um, that I will make him the king of Ayodhya. And then someone said, well, well what about Bharat? What do you, you know, if you make Ravana the king of Ayodhya, what about Bharat? And Lord Ram said, I will make him the king of Vaikuntha, the spiritual world. Isn't that beautiful? So it just shows how, how the Lord just becomes the slave of the, of the love of his devotees. So, yeah, Krishna says in the Gita that if we can become free from the, all attachments and aversions and be able, become able to control our senses through these regulative principles of freedom, which sounds totally counterintuitive, right? Free, but control, yeah? Then we can obtain the complete mercy of the Lord. And try our best, and Krishna will help us. So, um, yeah, Krishna tells, tells Arjuna in Bhagavad Gita, each one of us is on a certain battlefield. We hear this so many times, right? You go to your office, you have your family, you have your issues, you have all your stuff. So Krishna told Arjuna, Mam Anismara Yudhya He said, you just remember me and fight. So this is the ticket to Krishna consciousness, to remember Krishna while we're... Even this one asked Chakravarti Thakur says, remember Krishna while you're brushing your teeth. I, I'm brushing my teeth for who? I'm brushing my teeth for Krishna. I'm taking a shower for Krishna. Whatever you do, remember Krishna and fight. So that's, um, that's a beautiful point about Krishna consciousness. And so in conclusion, I just wanted to say that where, where is actually the land of the free and the home of the brave? Right? Where is that place? Is it here in Washington, D.C.? Or anybody have want to venture an answer? Where is the land of the home, free and the home of the brave? Yes. Goloka Vrindavan. Oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Or you could say, you could say in Vaikuntha, right? Vaikuntha, the spiritual world, means the place beyond all kunta, beyond all misery. That's what Vaikuntha is. So that's where the land of the free and the home of the brave is in the spiritual world. And, you know, we're being invited. Like Prabhupada says, Krishna is ever inviting the fallen conditioned souls to associate with him in pastimes of love. So, um, yeah, thank you so much. These are a few thoughts on freedom, bravery, and also on slavery. So what do you think? Any, um, any thoughts, any takeaways, any feedback, or any questions? Um, Anything else you'd like to share? Yes, young man here. It's all a lot deeper than I thought it was. <laughs> Freedom and bravery. There's like a, a huge meaning to. Put your mic up so we can. There's a huge meaning to these small words that. No, wow. I never knew about Yeah, thank you so much. So think about it, yeah. Meditate, meditate on it, think about it. You know, we can take it at the surface level, right? Or we can go deep and find the treasures. Because there are deep treasures if we go below the surface. Um, yeah, another question from that. Yes, from the lady side. Thank you, Radhika. Thank you for bringing all these brilliant boys up to us. I hope they're treating you well. They're doing so well, huh? <laughs> Making me proud. You know, I was going to say in regards to the um, reg regulative principles of freedom, one analogy that's sometimes helpful even for this age is that, like, traffic laws, like, we're, if, if, if you don't follow the laws of the traffic laws, then actually you're all, you know, no one can move forward, backwards. We've been in countries where it's like a log jam. But if you follow the, the rules, you actually have freedom to move your car down the road and you, you, know, you can get where you want to go. That's great. What a great example. But what if someone comes here from India or from England and says, I stay to the left. 
I'm British. No, this is the law of the land. You have to follow the rules, and then you have the freedom to drive wherever you want, right? Great example, thank you. From the men's side, any takeaways, sir? This is more of a comment, but you had talked about independence and freedom. So in 1976, BTG put out a cover specifically for the American Bicentennial, so they did a million copies, and the title was called Declaring Our Dependence on God. Declaring Our Dependence on God. 1976, back to God had the issue. For our Bicentennial, which at the time, we in Washington also ordered 100,000 copies and distributed them all summer long. 100,000 copies ordered in Washington. Yeah, that's a great, something to ponder, right? Are we declaring our independence? Are we really dependent on so many things? Are we always dependent on Krishna's will? And what about interdependence? I mean, this is a hot, an, hot, another whole Sunday Feast lecture. What about the fact that we're all interdependent on each other? Your happiness is my happiness. If I try to cause violence to you, that violence will come back to me. Really? Yes. What else? Something from the women's side. Okay, I'm going to ask questions from the women's side, then you're next. Um, when you say bravery, right? So, um, and then there's fear, generally. If you have to be brave, you have to feel some fear. And then Krishna says also, surrender to me, I'll take care of you. Do not fear, which seems to indicate we will be afraid. So, can you speak a little bit about fear and the connection to yeah. being brave? Yeah, I think you're speaking back, you're kind of heralding back to that definition I gave. That we will, and I'm just making the point, we will feel fear, right? But as this Christian author, this wise Christian author, Anne Lamont says, courage is fear that has set its prayers. So what does it mean? Yes, I'm afraid. I feel afraid. But I stop, right? This is like good bhakti yoga. I stop and I take a deep breath and I take a pause and I take shelter of Krishna. In my mind or in my heart, I can put my head right out of Krishna's feet, right? Maybe here they're on the altar, but in your own meditation, you can just put your head right on his feet. So, I, yes, I am afraid of this exam, of this new job interview, of this you know, new relationship, of this new just fill in the blanks. I am afraid, but I have to take shelter of Krishna. You guide me. And, and he will help us. And he will give us courage. That, that uh, quote that I quoted about Lord Ram, we come to the temple, so come up to him. He's here with his hand, right hand up, waiting for you to award you courage. Come up to him and say, I am yours, and he will award you courage for whatever struggles you're going through in your life. Okay? So yes, recognize that fear. I am afraid. And then take shelter, Krishna. Great question. Thank you very much. What else? Question this. I think it just shows how Krishna consciousness uh, can be, uh, like Krishna can be applied to anything, and how these words that are so important to the U.S. government are can also be applied to Krishna consciousness and our practice of bhakti. Yeah, very true. How these words that we think of as maybe just mundane patriotism, how they can all be applied to bhakti and how important that is. Um, yeah. Is, I wanted to bring out one other point if there's time. We have about five minutes? Yeah. Okay. I wanted to bring up this one other point that's kind of interesting because sometimes people who are not on the path of bhakti, criticize that, oh, if you practice bhakti, you'll become a feminine. You won't be strong and brave anymore. And, they, and, and one scholar criticized Maharaj Prataparudra, the king of Puri, that after he became a, um, a, a follower of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, that he, he lost his competitive edge. He wasn't fighting his enemies so strongly, you know, like the neighboring kingdoms. He wasn't going after them like he used to. But, you know, I would propose that maybe he was fighting the greater enemies. Maybe he was fighting the greater enemies, those internal enemies, and he didn't care so much about some petty king. And, 
next day over that he has to defeat him and steal his stuff, right? Maybe he was going after the, the more important enemies. And, um, you know, what about Arjuna? Such a great fighter. Was he a feminine? He fought so fearlessly on the battle of Kurukshetra. What about Shivaji? Everybody in India knows the great Shivaji, right? He was a disciple of Tukaram. He, like, folded his hands and bowed at the feet of the great Vaishnava, Saint Tukaram. And he got his courage to fight and defeat all his enemies. And there's even this one story, if I have time, I want to share this one story. So there's this one Jaipur king, and he was such a great devotee. But, you know, kings can be pretty fearless and pretty strong. So he told all of his ser servants in the, in the palace, do not disturb me when I'm doing my puja of Govindaji in my puja room. Do not disturb me. And everyone knew they could not come to him with anything before 12 noon every day, right? So what happened was, maybe the word got out, I don't know, but there were some people, I think moguls, attacking the kingdom. And, you know, they had to get the king out of his puja. And, but they couldn't, they were afraid that when he, off with their heads, if, he, if they, he interrupt his worship of Govindaji. So everyone was afraid to interrupt him. But meanwhile, out at the palace gate, there are these guys attacking the kingdom. They didn't know what to do, right? So finally, what happened was, what everybody saw was that the king came out in his full battle dress. And he just started, like, whooping those enemies and fighting them like anything. Everybody was so happy. Okay, the king's come up. And even he got wounded. His leg was bleeding, right? And this was all before 12 noon. This is what everybody saw. And then what happened was at 12 noon, the king comes out of his puja room. Teddy Bowl, he was all happy. And he finished his puja. And everyone was shocked. But, but Maharaj, we just saw you on the battlefield. And you were, you were even bleeding. And, and, and so he suspected. And he went to see his beloved Govindaji in the temple room. And there was Govindaji and the deity of Govindaji. His leg was bleeding. So Govinda, because he was such a surrendered soul, such a surrendered pure devotee of Govindaji, Govindaji, and he was so dedicated to not interrupting his puja every day, Govindaji himself went out and fought this battle for him. And the deity himself was bleeding. So wow, what about bravery? What about uh, not becoming effeminate on the path of bhakti? So another thought. Like that one? Good. Okay. I think we'd better end. Um, thank you all so much. For your time.